I also pray, and now as we come to your word, that you would help us, help us to get it, help us know it, help us understand it, help us believe it. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. One of the things I've been reminded of the past few weeks is just how normal America is. We tend to think of our country as unique, and in some ways it has been, but, but on the whole, it's normal. And by normal, I mean when you look at the grand scope of history and all of the countries and all of the people groups that have come before us, we are following the same pattern that they followed. And the pattern is this. We are a sinful people who love to sin. It's Romans 1, right? You look into Romans 1 and you see that we are a people that loves to worship and serve the creation rather than the creator, even though God has made it plain to us who he is. And this shows itself in a number of ways, but one of the primary ways is this. That the faithful people of God, the followers of Jesus, the children of God, will inevitably suffer pain, persecution, and heartache because they choose to follow Jesus. And my purpose in mentioning that this morning is not to, you know, go on a bash America rant. I'm thankful to live here. Um, You know, we can queue up Lee Greenwood. I'm proud to be an American, right? I really am. I'm so thankful that God has put me here in this time, in this place. But my concern is that most American Christians have been lulled into a sense of security and a sense of peace. We read the Bible and what it says about suffering and what it says about affliction, and we think, well, that happened to them back then. Or we read things about how More Christians are suffering for their faith today than other points in history, and we tend to think of it, well, that that happens to them over there. But we are enlightened. We have religious freedom. We have peace. But I'm convinced that our time of peace is coming to an end. And very soon, American Christians will join their brothers and sisters throughout the world and throughout history in being persecuted for Christ's sake. And we're not ready for it. We will get to the place where our Constitution won't save us. And the Supreme Court can't protect us. Political elections will do us no good, and the problem is we're not ready for it. So it's my prayer that whenever we come across persecution in Scripture, that it won't be foreign to us. Not because I want us to suffer, but because I want us to be ready when suffering does come. Which is why one of the reasons we're starting a new series today on the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's not primarily about suffering or persecution, but man, was that a reality that that church had to deal with. And, and we're going to cover chapter 1 today, but I want to encourage you, um, go home today and read Acts chapter 17, because that's going to give you the backdrop of everything that happens. We see the founding of the church in Thessalonica by Paul and his friends. Um, we're going to see the start of the church there. I'll try to give you a brief uh, introduction here, but, but read it because you'll get some really good stuff. The Apostle Paul along with his friends Silas and Timothy, were on their second missionary journey. They preached for three consecutive weeks in Thessalonica, which is in modern-day Greece, and many people believe and put their faith in Jesus. Others hear their message and hate it. They start rioting and chase the missionaries out of town and continue a campaign of terror against these new believers. It was a dangerous time to be a Christian. Paul has, is forced to flee, but he's still concerned about this infant church. Uh, he's concerned for them. Uh, what's going to happen when they get persecuted? What's going to happen when they face the suffering? Will, will they abandon their faith when they lose their jobs? Will they abandon Christ when they get beat? And so Paul arrives in Corinth, and he sends Timothy back. He says, I want you to go back to Thessalonica, see how they're doing. So Timothy does. He comes back. He brings a report to Paul. Hey, Paul, guess what? They're doing good. They're doing good. 
And in response to that, in joy from hearing this good report, he writes a letter to the church. It's this letter of 1 Thessalonians. And what we see is it's primarily a letter of thankfulness. He's letting the church know, hey, I'm happy for you. But as we're about to read, his thankfulness isn't to them, it's for them. He's directing his thankfulness to God. Saying, okay, okay church, um, I, I'm, I'm wanting you to know how thankful to God I am for you. So let's look at it. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, that's Silas, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you. Constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned from God, I'm sorry, to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. I said this is primarily a letter of thankfulness. And I want to start by looking at the big picture so that we can see this theme clearly. This is a brief letter. It's, it's five short chapters. And in the first three chapters, it's Paul saying, okay, church, here's how I'm praying for you. Listen to this, chapter 1, verse 2, we give thanks to God for you. And the rest of the chapter says, here's why we're giving thanks to God for you. Chapter 2.13 uh, says, we also thank God for this. And the rest of chapter 2 is, why he's thankful to God for them. Then in chapter 3, verse 10, he says again, here's what we're praying for you. And then you get to chapters 4 and 5 where Paul says, okay, so now here's what I want you to do. I want you to do something. And we'll be there in a few weeks, but it's basically two things. I want you to be holy, and I want you to encourage each other. Right? Act like Jesus and encourage others to act like Jesus as well. But the thrust behind all of this is Paul saying, I'm praying for you, and it's primarily a prayer of thankfulness. So I want us to keep this in mind as we go through it, because we're going to read Paul talk about things like election, salvation, God's wrath. He's going to talk about satanic disruptions, right? I wanted to do something and Satan prevented me. He's going to talk about that. Talk a lot about the second coming of Jesus. And it's a lot of things that you would normally find in systematic theology books, then you get to chapters 4 and 5, and he's going to talk about issues like sexual purity and greed, work ethic, even, even rules for financial welfare. But if we're not careful, we'll fall into the trap of thinking Paul is just giving us either a systematic theology book or a book on how to behave. And both of those separate the heart of the letter, which is, I'm thankful that God is at work in you. And if you separate the systematic doctrines and the moral things he wants them to do, if you take those away from the thankfulness, then we will not be able to encourage each other the way he wants us to. So how does God want us to be encouraged? Here's a six-word summary of chapter one. Right, if you're wondering, what is, what is chapter one about? Six, six words. God is at work in you. God is at, I'm thankful to God because he is at work in you. Look at it again, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, 
constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. The grammar in the sentence is inter- interesting because the main verb is give thanks, right? We give thanks. And then there are three participles that go with it. We give thanks. Here's three ways we give thanks. Mentioning, remembering, and knowing. So we're thanking God for you. We're mentioning you. Why? Because we remember something. We remember your work of faith. We remember your labor of love. We remember what he's doing in giving you this hope that's made you steadfast. right? Faith and hope and love, these, these basic blocks of the Christian life. And this faith in Christ and the love that you have for him, this hope that he gives, it's produced something in you. It's produced work and it's produced labor and it's produced perseverance. And so Paul is saying, we remember that. We're thanking God, we're remembering you, And then he's going to go into detail. Our thankfulness to God comes to the fact that we know something about you. We know that God has chosen you. He's comforting this church, saying, I want you to know that God has picked you. He has elected you. He has chosen you. He wanted you. Now, I know that for some people, this doctrine of election is something of a bugbear, and for other believers, it's a source of pride. But in Scripture, election, the the truth that God has chosen, who will be saved, that truth always serves two purposes, to give comfort to the believer and to fuel evangelism. And we're going to see both of those in this passage. So we thank God for you, Thessalonians, knowing he's chosen you. And in the rest of the passage of chapter 1, Paul is laying out, here's how we know that God has chosen you. Look at verse 5. We know God has chosen you. Why, verse 5? Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. I love this. Okay, church, I want you to know that God has chosen you. Here's the first piece of evidence I'm putting forward. It has nothing to do with you. It's all about God. This is the opposite of the way we we usually start thinking through this, right? You you wrestle with your faith and you're doubting, man, am I, was I really saved when I said I got saved? You go through a a time of doubt and, and struggling with this and you're wondering, am I really a Christian? And whenever we go through those times, we typically... Um, we'll go back and look at ourselves. Well, I know I'm a believer because when I was eight, I made a decision for Jesus. Right? I, if, especially if you're Baptist, I, I walked down the aisle. I remember that. That's how I know I'm saved because I made that decision. Pastor wrote his name in the Bible and the date. Or if you're Southern Baptist especially. Right? I was at camp. I wrote all my sins on a piece of paper and I nailed them to the cross. Right? I know I'm saved because I did those things. But that's not the, what Paul does. Right? Typically when doubts come, we first go to ourselves. Am I saved? Let me look and see what I'm doing. That's not what Paul does. His emphasis is on what God did when the gospel was preached to these Thessalonians. Evidence number one that you really are chosen, look what God did. He says, yes, we gave you the gospel in word, but it wasn't just our words. The Holy Spirit showed up, and he showed up in power. Now, this Holy Spirit power could refer to something like miraculous signs, but I think Paul is pointing to something bigger than that. I mean, it could include signs, but but I think the idea is this. From beginning to end, from the missionaries first opening up their mouths to give the gospel, to the way that they spoke, the the energy that they spoke with, the conviction that they spoke with, the, the specific words that they said, the way that those words penetrated the ears of these Thessalonians and went into their minds and into their hearts and the fact that they believed and called upon the name of the Lord. Paul's looking at all of that saying that was a supernatural thing. God did that. The Holy Spirit was doing that. See, sometimes we, me as the pastor, or you when when you're witnessing to friends or family, we sometimes fall into this trap of thinking, okay, well, here I am, I have the gospel, that person needs to hear it. 
And so I'm going to, I, I got to say my part. I got to work up what to say. I got to kind of think through that. And, and then I know that they need to hear. And so what God's going to do is he's going to take my words and he's going to do something supernatural to them, kind of like when they're in the air. Like I speak and then when they're out floating among the particles, God's going to do something with them to make them attractive to you. That's kind of how we typically think. And while that can happen, I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. I think he's saying all of it. It's not just once the words leave my mouth. It's as the missionaries are speaking and their attitude and the way that they're communicating and the words that they're choosing to the very fact that you would believe anyways that God is doing all of that. It's all a work of God. And so Paul is saying, I thank God because he chose you and I know that he chose you because look at your salvation experience It wasn't you. It was God doing it all. Second, look at the end of verse 5. He says, You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. You know what he's, he's saying here, especially when you get to verses 9 and 10 and you bring that in? He's saying, we were disciples who made disciples all for the preeminence of Jesus. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And this may seem kind of basic, but you learn how to follow by following, right? I mean, put yourself back in second grade. Um, your class is playing following the leader, Right, and so there's someone you know leading, and they'll dip down or they'll raise their hand, and everyone following behind them has to do the same thing, and they're marching around the classroom. But there's this one kid who decides to sit down at the table and play with Legos and starts building himself a little house. Right, and the teacher comes and says, well, "What are you doing?" He says, "I'm following the leader." She says, "No, you're not." The, the leader is walking around the classroom, and people are following him. You're just sitting here doing your own thing. Listen to this, and this is hard to hear. Paul assures these Thessalonians, we weren't saying one thing with our mouths and doing something different in our lives. We followed Jesus. You saw us following Jesus, and then you imitated us. You imitated Jesus. Here's why this is a hard thing to hear. If you look back at verse 6, you imitated us, you imitated Jesus For you receive the word with much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So let's play follow the leader again. Jesus is at the front of the line. He's walking down the road. Our our job is to follow him. And then we, we see he turns down the road of affliction. Do we follow him? We look down that road and we see that it's marked full of suffering and heartache and pain. Do we follow him? We look further down the road and we see that it's a dead end. I mean, literally, the road of suffering that Jesus walked on, he died at the end of that road. We, We look down that he's walking towards his death. Do we follow him? Jesus himself said, whoever would follow after me must take up his cross. They persecuted the prophets. They malign and murdered Jesus. What do you think is going to happen to us? I mean, from the beginning, I mean, the the New Testament takes us all the way back to Abel, right? You had Cain and Abel. Abel was the faithful one who was killed for being faithful to God. All the way from the beginning, the true children of God have always walked a treacherous road of suffering and heartache. And yet, today, we somehow think that Jesus has left the road of suffering. That that's what he used to do, but now he has found peace on the American highway, built on constitutional freedoms of religious liberty that they simply didn't have before. And if Jesus had only been alive in America, he wouldn't have had to die. We really believe that. 
But Jesus didn't change his mind. It's not like he was hanging on the cross thinking, gosh, if only I had done something different or only if these Romans and and Jews had a better political system, it wouldn't have come to this. That's not what he was thinking. We know that because what does Scripture say? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus took this road of affliction, this road of suffering, he took that road joyfully. Why? Because he knew there was something better at the end that would make it all worth it. He knew that he would be back with his father, completing the work that his father had given him to do, and bringing with him all of his children, a people from every tribe and tongue that would experience the same joy that he did. And so today, if we are going to follow Jesus and follow those who follow Jesus, then we must walk down the road of affliction. We can't simply sit off to the side building our own house with the temporary things of earth and call ourselves followers, thinking that we somehow beat the system. In fact, to bring it back to verse 6, Paul's whole point in bringing up this imitation of affliction was to assure them that they really were saved. We know he has chosen you for you receive the word in much much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all believers. You imitated us and you, you, Jesus suffered joyfully, Paul suffered joyfully, and now he's telling them, look, you're imitating us And all the believers look at you as an example to follow. And yet today we have an an entire church industry that's built on imitating churches that have learned the best at avoiding suffering and avoiding pain. So Paul is here thanking God, saying, "I'm, I'm thankful for what you have done in the Thessalonians. You chose them. And we know that because they received the gospel supernaturally. And then they followed us and they followed you in the road of suffering. Here's the last thing. I said he gave three evidences that they're chosen, right? Here's the last one. Verse 8. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception that we had among you. (coughs) And how you turned from God, uh, (laughs) every time, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Catch this. How did he know that they were chosen? Because this church gained a reputation. Everybody who heard knew something incredible has happened in Thessalonica. Paul's saying, I don't even have to tell these surrounding areas about what God did because they've already heard. I don't have to update them. They've already received the update. These people in Thessalonica had a work of faith among them. They turned away from their idols and served God. They, they had this new labor of love. And, and the entire focus of their lives changed from temporary life and building up temporary kingdoms and enjoying temporary safety. Their eyes were turned to God and the hope that he had for them, that there's an eternity coming with Christ. Or maybe it's good to look at this backwards. Verse 10, it's all because of the gospel. Jesus came to deliver us from the wrath of God. Because of sin in our lives, our own personal lives, because of sin in our land, and everyone has sinned, right? One lie, one negative thought, one complaint, one whining, one anger, a moment of anger where you strike out at someone, one deceptive thought, one lustful look, right? All of these are enough to condemn us. We are all sinners, and because of that, we have the wrath of God on us. It's not only that we're under a death sentence, although that's true, but we also have the wrath of God on us now. Well, Jesus came to deliver us from that wrath of God, and he secured it by, he secured that deliverance by dying for us. He, he took the wrath of God that was on us and meant for us, he took that on himself. And he died. 
But then he rose from the dead, and, and right now he is in heaven with his Father preparing a place for us, for his children. And he has a set day that he's coming back. We don't know when that is, but God the Father's already marked it off in the calendar. And until Jesus does come back, we wait knowing that what is coming in Christ will make the things of this world seem ridiculous. I mean, the idols that we love to serve. We see them for what they really are when we come to Christ. Now, I know we, we, we hear idols and, and we think, well, most of us don't have little statues that we bow down to. I mean, a lot of the world still does. We don't have statues, but we have idols. We have, we have glowing boxes that we revolve our lives around. We have paper in our pocket that we worship because it buys us stuff and gives us security. We don't have statues, but we have idols. The worst one, it's in everyone's bathroom. You walk in and there's a mirror and you can look at that and you can see the biggest idol that every one of us will face. We all love ourselves and we worship ourselves. We don't have statues, but we have idols. But when the gospel of Jesus Christ comes and supernaturally works in you, you see the idols for what they truly are, and you gladly leave them behind. And it's such a dramatic shift that people recognize you're different. They may not like it. And they're, they're going to be explicit. You, you met Jesus and everything changed. You made this decision to follow Jesus and you're not the same anymore. They may not like it. I think it's pretty clear in the world that most people don't like Christians. They see a change that has happened to us because it's so explicit. So putting all this together, right? This is the letter of thankfulness. I know it hasn't seemed thankful this morning, but this is a letter of thankfulness, right? We haven't forgotten that. We're going to keep it in our minds throughout. Paul is thankful that God has chosen a group of people, these new believers. And he knows they're chosen because they had a powerful, supernatural gospel experience. And they turned from their own way. They turned from following their idols. They started following Jesus. And everyone could tell that they were different. And this gave them an unnatural joy. I use that word unnatural because it's not something that comes naturally. It's come, it comes from the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not the way the rest of the world thinks. Pain comes, suffering comes, and we're, we're joyful. It's not glib, but it's joy. A joy that grew even in the midst of pain and sorrow, which they had a lot of because they followed Jesus. When you think about this church, what is it you are thankful for? All right, Paul's thinking about the Thessalonians. Here's what he's thankful for. I'm thankful God has chosen you. Here's how I know. When you think about our church, what is it you are thankful to God for? What, what is it on your list? Are we like the Thessalonians who are following the brothers and sisters in Christ from generations past? Are we following the same road that they followed? Are we following Jesus? I mean, does our church look like Jesus? Or when you think about your own spiritual life, your family's spiritual life, what is it you were thankful to God for? Or maybe, let me ask it this way. Who are you following? I mean, do people look at your life and say, man, look at what God is doing with him. Look at, what, look at what God has done with her, even if they don't like it. Here's what I've been wrestling through. Paul and his friends come. Three weeks they preach. The Holy Spirit's there. God is involved. But one of the proofs that God was involved is Paul and his friends get chased out of town, and these new believers suffer affliction. Three weeks the church gets established and grows in the midst of pain, persecution, and affliction. And they did that, he says, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. But we can't even make it through a mild pandemic without whining and complaining and blaming everyone that's not on our side and posting things on social media 
about how wicked everyone is. It makes me wonder who we're following. We are to follow Jesus. Right now, He is in heaven with our Father who knows. Our Father knows how to give good gifts to His children. And God has not made a mistake in giving the church what it is going through today. God did not slip up when He allowed us, not even allowed us, when He led us through a pandemic, political turmoil, race issues. None of this is by accident. God is bringing us through this so that as we go through it, we will be able to show the unbelieving world the gospel of Jesus Christ and the joy that comes with following Him, a joy that they can't get anywhere else. God wants people in our land to hear the gospel. And He's leading us on the perfect road. He did not make one mistake when he jotted out our journey, our path. He's leading us through this so that we will look like Jesus and people will be drawn to him. So will we follow him? Will we follow him through these things so that he will supernaturally use us to bring people to faith? Let's pray.